Once again, it's my honor to uh, introduce a gifted speaker who uh, was really a blessing to Sharon and me not long ago, back in August. We found we were sharing a flight out of Springfield, Missouri to go to the uh, Hear the Watchman Conference in Boise, Idaho. But our flight out of uh, Springfield was delayed by an hour and, uh, was it an hour and 20 minutes? Hour and 20 minutes because uh, there was no spare oxygen on the plane. We, we took a vote among the passengers and decided we wanted to wait for the oxygen. <laughs> well, that got us into Denver an hour and 20 minutes late. Unfortunately, we only had an hour and 15 minute layover scheduled. As you recall, that was the weekend of the great American eclipse. And everyone in North America was trying to go to Boise because that was the best place on the continent to watch the eclipse. So we went to the United Airlines counter and they said, well, we can get you there on Monday. <laughs> well, we're speaking there like tomorrow. Well, after checking every possible connection, Seattle, Phoenix, Dallas, Chicago, Minneapolis, we can get you there on Monday. <laughs> Until they remembered Sun Valley, Idaho. They flew us in there and uh, so we were able to get there thanks to a volunteer who drove six hours round trip to Sun Valley and back to get us to the conference. But it turned what would have been an eight hour day into an 18 hour travel day, which would have been a nightmare had it not been for the fellowship and the fascinating conversation with our next speaker. He is the founder and chancellor of Biblical Life College and Seminary, the author of the best selling books, The Shinar Directive and The Shireth Imperative. Please welcome our friend, Dr. Michael Lake. How many know all the glory goes to Jesus? Amen. Now, before we do anything, we're going to pray because either it's between me talking and fellowshipping with everybody during the conference or the feather pillow that was on my bed that I'm allergic to, I'm about to lose my voice. So the kingdom of God is greater. And how many know the anointing fixes a lot of stuff? Amen. So, Father, right now, in the name of Jesus, I come before your throne. Father, I submit myself to your spirit, soul, and body. And Father, I ask for the anointing of the Holy Spirit to take hold of my body, my mind, and my spirit right now. I only want to speak that which you want me to speak. And Father, I ask that you would enable my voice to speak your truth and that you would enable all of our ears to hear it and take it to heart. And we give you all the praise and the glory for it. In Jesus' name. You know, this morning I woke up and I actually rewrote all my notes. I uh, woke up with what I call Holy Ghost unsatisfaction because it's like I woke up and God says, you need to work on this just a little bit. I want you to emphasize some things you weren't planning on and throw out a bunch of stuff you were planning on. But I want to review how many were here Friday night when I spoke. Okay, some of you, the rest of you, we're going to get a real quick catch up. Number one, I dealt with the reality that there's a progressive falling away of the angels. You know, we've always been taught that when Lucifer fell, all of them fell with him. But we take that from a scripture in Revelation 12. How I many know oh, that's in the back of the book? And when you put it back in context, it was not a kung fu flashback to the beginning of time. That we see that Lucifer fell, there was the war. We see the Nahesh in the garden was not Lucifer. It's a seraph, not a cherubim. And so the, the, the flaming serpent fell in the garden. The, uh, the watchers fell in Genesis 6. The principalities and powers and rulers of darkness fell at the Tower of Babel. And there's this progressive falling away. We also discovered when Lucifer fell that he was the anointed cherub that covered. And when he did his five I wills to try to facilitate his ascension into godhood, it corrupted the anointing that was in him and created something called iniquity. I call it the iniquity force. And that all occultists, what they call magic power, uh, this, this current of energy that is all the iniquity force. They're, they're, they're disciplined and committed to learning how to tap into that. We also discovered that Lucifer's not all-knowing, he's, all, he's not ever present, and he's not all-powerful. The Bible also tells us that God set a fire in the midst of him to begin to eat up this power, and so he had to find a way of replenishing the iniquity force, and so what he did is he infused it into humanity. Sin empowers hell. That's why the Bible says we need to be quick to repent. 
Because if we let it take hold and we keep that sin, we're empowering the very thing that will destroy us. That's why when sin has its work completed, it brings forth what? Death. Be quick to repent. Finally, and I don't have my review in here. Oh, here we go. The mystery religions are dedicated to it. And I mean dedicated. They, will, they have plans that span over millennia, guys. We have a hard time planning what we want to do for Jesus next week. And they know what they want to do in 2030. They're talking all about it, aren't they? You see, they knew they couldn't take over planet Earth in the 1700s, in the 1600s, in the 1800s, they have been waiting for the beginning of the 20th century because they understood from the book of Enoch that the watchers were not going to be released until the beginning of the 20th century. So in the previous generation, they released three mind viruses that are occult in nature into humanity. Spiritism, if it wasn't for Blavatsky, the women of Rill wouldn't know how to channel the watchers, okay? You, uh, the eugenics, genetic manipulation. Does that sound familiar if you understand Genesis 6? And the lie of evolution. You know, when I look at what's going on in our colleges today, it is not, it is not a document of evolution, but de-evolution. Yeah. We're going backwards, turning into snowflakes, or I don't know what we're turning into. We're turning into a lot of things. But what I want to drill into your consciousness today, and I, this is something I want you to meditate on, and mark in your Bible is Matthew chapter 16, 18 to 19. When Jesus spoke this, he was talking about the full council. When you talk about the gates of a city, the gates of a nation, you're talking about all their generals are there, all their elders are there, all their leadership is there. Guys, the apostles never had to face a watcher. They never had to face advanced technology. The most, the, the advanced technology that they ever had to face was something called the end of a Roman sword. And how many know those boys didn't even have to plug that thing in? It just, it worked all the time. But that's, that's the, as, as advanced as it got. Jesus was looking past them to our day. He said, one day the church is going to stand before the full gates of hell, that full council of hell. Lucifer, the Nehesh, the Watchers, the principalities and powers and all the hordes of hell. But here's the promise. They will not prevail against the church. They will not prevail. You also need to get your authority in who you are in Christ. If you get it deep in your heart, if, I don't care if they're a watcher. I don't care if it's a principality and power. Now, I'm getting into spiritual warfare and departing from my notes, but this is okay. You do not go into the second heaven to confront principalities and powers. That's not your territory. You are not authorized to go there. Well, what happens if I do? Okay, there's a sleeping grizzly bear over there, and I want you to take a pencil and poke it. How many know that won't work out well for you? And it's not worked out well for a lot of people in spiritual warfare that presumptuously begin to go and viciously attack a spirit over the, over the area, not realizing that they didn't have authority to do it. You begin beseeching the Father to do spiritual warfare and send angels to war against that thing. Okay, we got to know our protocols. But if it manifests, I don't care if it's a Nephilim, I don't care if it's a UFO, like what L.A. Marzulli says, you know, you rebuke as you're leaving because it can, mess, it can mess with your mind, but let it know it's been rebuked. Because if you don't rebuke it, it will follow you as you leave. Preferably, it goes one way, you go the other. And when it's rebuked, it does. We have got to know our authority. Now, in my first book, in the Shiner Directive, I gave you a panoramic overview of, of all the elite have been doing and their plans and how to connect the dots historically, especially in the 19th and the 20th century that we are literally living in the matrix, guys. Nothing, how many know that we have not been a constitutional republic for well over 100 years? They just waved the constitution and waved the flag, but the guys in D.C. are simply puppets on a string, and that's why they're so upset with our current president, because he ain't got no strings on him, and he was not a part of the club, because the Republican and Democratic Party are two legs to the same beast. Come on now.
But hell may have its directive, but how many know that heaven has its imperative? God is awakening the remnant. Turn to your neighbor and say, I'm the remnant. Do you know how I can tell you're the remnant? Yeah, you're here. Non-remnant don't come to meetings like this. Why are you studying prophecy for? Why do you want to, you know, I just want the best life now. Well, your best life is swirling like this as it's being flushed and you don't even know it. You think, woohoo, I'm moving now. <laughs> no, no, you're not. And I've had a lot of people say, I, I need a definition of the remnant because, you know, the remnant that, it can be that which is left over, that which is always faithful to God. And so in the next book that I'm writing, I ask God to give me a prophetic definition of the remnant. Now, this is what he gave me. The remnant is comprised of those that have a true heart for God and a deep desire to be faithful to him alone, regardless of the cost. This can prophetically include those that are in some type of spiritual bondage that frustrates this holy desire within them. As the kingdom is manifested and decreed, destruction is released upon the enemies of God. His remnant will experience salvation and deliverance that enable them to serve their king unfettered. That's one of the reasons why I believe that we're on the verge of the greatest revival planet Earth has ever seen. You see, there's something about ready to break the mind control. There's something that God's going to do. There's something that God's going to do that is going to provide a supernatural breakthrough for those that have been believing for years. Minds that have never been clear are going to gain clarity. That generational curses are going to be broken because it was the hand of God because he says, these are my people and they will serve me. And I will do this thing for the sake of my great name, not theirs. Amen. And God's getting ready <coughs> to do a thing. Now, where are we at right now? In Daniel, it talks about, in Daniel chapter 12, verse 4, But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal up the book, even to the time of the end. How many know we're kind of there? Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. Now, when you look at that word in Hebrew, the oath, it did not mean, that only means knowledge, perception, discernment, understanding, wisdom. But what's interesting in the Hebrew, it's not just the oath, it's ha da oath. It's the knowledge. The knowledge. Do you think Almighty God is going to let the watchers show up? And I believe that Blavosky was probably uh, fellowshipping with, a, with a, a council of seraphim because seraphim, when they take human form, are white guys with white beards, the great white council. She was visited by a whole herd of Santa Clauses, I guess. Um, <clears throat> That, that deceived her. You have the watchers releasing technology that are controlling things behind the scene. Every nation has a channeling center that the elite have set up that the principality over that nation tells that channeler what to do. And they'll call the, the, the Washington, D.C. or whatever the nation, that nation is and tell their leaders what that spirit has said. They get the marching orders don't come from D.C. And in fact... It doesn't come from the deep state unless you consider the real deep state, hell itself. These people are under control of spirits. And there's knowledge being released on how to control the minds of men using technology and using many different things. Do you think for a minute God is going to allow that without God releasing some knowledge of his own. That's why conferences like this are so important because each one of us, God begins to give us this tapestry of information and as we all put it together, we begin to see the big picture and each one of us have a piece of the puzzle and when it comes together, it's the knowledge that God wants to release in the hearts of the remnant so that we can stand. Now listen to me, the rapture, it's not about you getting out of here before you get your head beat in. It is you are a Navy SEAL holding the line that you have given the Antichrist hell and he can't overcome. The Daniel says that when he is at the zenith of his power, there will be those that do great exploits because they know their God. 
that we will mature as much as we can mature, that we are ready to transition from the bride to the wife. And he says, go get her because she's ready. Not go get her for her head's beat in. It's like, okay, the Antichrist can't make one more step until I get her out of the way. But when I get her out of the way, I have these vials of judgment I'm going to loose up on his head once my girl is out of the way. That's the rapture. That's why there's one glass great revival that we're going to have. And if you're a younger generation, there is an anointing on you. I want you guys to so surpass my understanding of the Word of God that when I listen to you, I want my jaw to drop, and I want to be in awe of what God gives you. That, that is the legacy for this generation. And what us oldens are doing is trying to get you to where you can stand on our shoulders and take it to another level. I'm waiting for some of you guys to teach me. Glory to God. And that's not just teaching me how to use my computer. <laughs> okay, which key is enter? <laughs> guys, the elite have worked their plans. Now, they released all this stuff. But one of the things that they have, they have transitioned humanity. Listen, spiritism had to channel information from the watchers. And the women of real, when you understand what the women of real were doing, they gave advanced technology to Nazi Germany. Nazi Germany also had its Roswell. These UFO crashes are Christmas presents. Here's advanced technology. You know, if you're such an advanced technological society, you don't crash your stuff, Okay. You're, were you looking at the daisy and you hit a tree? You know, what's going on here? No, it's, oops, here's our technology. Reverse engineer it. But Blavatsky taught the women of real how to channel information from the watchers. When we entered into World War II, we were still flying uh, prop planes. Well, the Nazis had jet engines. They were a generation at least ahead of everybody else. And it created an arms race. So we have spiritism, we, we have eugenics. It's the mother of the transhumanist movement. We just need to tweak your DNA, you know. Uh, well, Mark, you know, you could probably slim down if you had a little bit more bull DNA, you know, because you fly all this bull around anyway, you just need more bull, you know, or, or be cat DNA or whatever. You know, oh, no, I like to be 100% human. This human may be big and round, but at least it's human, okay? But this idea that we can improve on the creation of God. And see, evolution stripped our... If, if there's evolution, there is no God. And you put all three of them together, it set us on a trajectory so that we would want to become a God. The whole thing about AI and the singularity, the very ones that reject the God of the Bible are trying to create their own. They're either trying to create their own or to become one. How can you try to create or become that which you've denied? No, that, that's circular logic, isn't it? Crazy, crazy stuff. Well, do you think that an AI is going to become sentient? No, I think it's going to become possessed by a watcher. That's part of what the D-Wave quantum computer is. What they're doing, there's a quantum barrier between the first heaven and what I call dimension zero because it has, it's where hell is and where Tartarus is. It's little cracks in the wall, and they feed a question. They don't even know how the answer comes back. And sometimes it's like, I want to know what's going to happen tomorrow. I said, no, here's what's going to happen next week. It's that kind of thing. It's, it's scary. They don't even know how AIs work. It's a box. They dump all this stuff in. They start monitoring and tweaking it to see what comes out. And here recently, they begin developing their own language that even the programmers didn't know. Let's get Bob. Okay, I'll get him later. You know, <laughs> old Bob's sitting there thinking, I don't know what they're talking about. Yeah, they're Terminators. Or are they demonic? Come on now. The stuff is going on. They are committed. They will go from generation to generation to generation. They will commit their fortunes, their very lives, everything to advance and to learn how to function within this dark force. 
and yet here we are playing church. The best of us, the best of what Christianity has produced, great men like Smith Wigglesworth and Spurgeon and all those, we should be going higher. True miracles by those that are true to God and won't compromise on his word and get into esoteric garbage and call it the Holy Spirit. I can't even stomach now. What are you? I am Bapticostal with a good swirl of Hebraic heritage. And I've got problems with the Baptists. I've got problems with the Charismatics. And I've got a whole lot of problems with the Hebraic movement. Because they're not staying true to the word. They're getting into Kabbalah, Talmud. Uh, and and I've, I've actually caught Baptists that were preaching this, this deep revelation about Jesus. And, uh, and I'm thinking, that's Manly P. Hall. You may be a Baptist preacher, but you're a Mason. Okay? We, we've got to stick with the Word. Stick with the Word. Let's go on. The women of Rill used several things to uh, help them in their channeling. The first were drugs that created altered states of consciousness. How many know that drugs are a real big problem in our day? Okay. One mind-altering drug that was created by our government, LSD, by CIA, um, was supposed to help people be able to see, to open up the third eye and all these different things. <coughs> they have turned our planet into an occult laboratory. And yet drugs are rampant. And I think what they have moved, they're, they're moving beyond altering our consciousness, is they're pacifying us. A drugged up population are very easy to control. There are too many of us that are hopped up on fluoride. <laughs> oh, Mike. So, what the Nazis used fluoride and all these other crazy things. Fluoride's a byproduct of creating aluminum that used to be used as rat poison. That kind of tells you what they think about us. They, they are chemically castrating our younger generation with estrogen and everything in your water bottles. Right now, when I was, when I was 30, and I could take a 30-year-old any, anywhere, and I had three, two to three times the testosterone levels when I were 30 than the current male population, and then we wonder why they're snowflakes. I'm so emotional. Get the estrogen out of your system. But it's all controlling. They use these things, and part of it is to control. Part of it is to see exactly what they can do to get us into altered states of consciousness, to either program us. You know, Mary and I deal with, with mind control programming. Do you know every one of you have been mind controlled? All you have to do is watch your TV set and don't plead the blood of Jesus between you and it. It only takes 60 seconds for you to go into an altered state of consciousness called an alpha state, and it shuts down the analytical side of your brain. And so whatever they're feeding you, they're doing social engineering. And they give you sitcoms, they give you alternate lifestyles and all these different things, and you're just feeding it in, feeding it in. And now we have a younger generation that tells their pastor, I don't feel the Word of God should say that. <laughs> Tough. <laughs> Snowflake. You better be careful because I found out how long is a snowflake's chance in hell? Okay? No. They also used Loyola's spiritual exercises, mental exercises to open up the third eye. It's a Jesuit exercise that's part mind control, part designed to open up the third eye. And we see that being used and popularized in a lot of areas. Anybody ever hear of meditation? Oh, well now we call it, you know, it used to be transcendental meditation. Now it's mindfulness. Just be mindful. <laughs> Just chillax. But it's used to open up the third eye. Now, this one, I, I can't figure out. 
We're having a new exercise program at church. It's going to be for weight loss, get you in shape. We're going to do yoga. Are you stuck on stupid? <laughs> we're going to play Christian music, and we're going to quote scriptures. It doesn't matter because every position is a prayer to a pagan demonic force. And the Hindu experts, how many know if you're going to find, I know if you're going to find out about karate, you go find somebody that's an expert in karate. You will find out about, you go to the masters of yoga. You cannot separate the religion from the exercise. You cannot. Because in all the distortions and stretches and everything you do is designed to wake up the snake that's coiled up at the bottom of your spine. And when it gets all the way up, it opens up the third eye the kundalini spirit. And we see it going on, this, this kundalini spirit in a lot of charismatic churches today. Now let me tell you something. I'm spirit filled. I talk, I'm like the apostle Paul. I talk to tongues more than y'all. Okay? But what I see going on, if, it, if you can't find it in the Bible, don't do it. If it's a manifestation that you do not find in the word of God, do not do it. You do not find where the Apostle Paul was preaching and people started barking like dogs. I tell you what, if that would have happened, he'd have stopped the service and cast the demon out of them. Come on now. And we call it the Holy Ghost. I've heard, I've heard some things. And, um, I quit watching Christian TV. I just battled my blood pressure. You couldn't preach your way out of a wet paper sack and you wouldn't even know what a Bible dictionary was if somebody hit you in the head with it. Just pick a verse here, pick a verse there and get a big offering. Give people truth. You see, I'm looking for people for truth. I don't care how hard it is. I don't care how much I got to change. I don't care how uncomfortable it makes me because truth, before it sets you free, will, what, will, it will make you so miserable you can't breathe because before you can be set free, what's between the uncomfortable and the free is repentance. Yeah. Yeah. This is in my nose. This is okay. What also is used in all occult is sexual energy. All, all Freemasonry is based upon Egyptian sex magic. You gather around the altar of Ashtaroth, there was another goddess that was connected to Ashtaroth. Her name was Pornia. Porn. That uh, if you weren't participating, you were watching what was going on around the altars of Ashtaroth. And all that is a collective energy. That's why there's, there's so much sexual perversion in D.C. and there's pedophilia and there's, uh, there's all kinds of things. There's thanks to Aliester Crowley and Thelema, transugethian magic is rampant in D.C. That's why there's so much homosexual pedophilia because not only are they basically sucking the youth out of those kids to try to extend their life, they believe that when you ritually do it, you can access other galaxies and other dimensions with gods that are older than Yahweh that you can get to enlist to empower what you're doing. And that's some of the most horrible stuff. Why do witches ride brooms? It's because in the ritual, for it to be done properly, there has to be a climax, and then she uses the broom to collect the energy. You say, oh, Mike, this is crazy. Yeah, it is. There was a guy after World War II that continued what the Nazis were researching on this. He was here in America, and I've got it in my book. I, I can't remember his name now. But he figured out a way to harness that and literally pull it out of the atmosphere. I guess he'd go into an area where people were living and stuff. He could pull it out of the atmosphere. And to prove that he was right, he went into the middle of the desert and released this stuff with a machine he had, caused it to rain, and immediately grass began to grow like it's speed. You know, you know it's also, there's grass. You know what the government did? They threw him in jail and made sure he died in jail. They seized all of his research and supposedly destroyed it and then made research into that area illegal right after World War II. You think he tapped into something he wasn't supposed to tap into? 
And yet we have a generation that now porn is defining our sexuality, not the Word of God. And it's like in a competition on what can get worse and more debased and, and everything else. And they're defining what it is. And now we have a, we have a sexed, crazed generation that can't even figure out what sex they are. And at the whole time, they don't, what they don't understand, there are warlocks and witches established through their communities pulling all that violation. In fact, if you go into a city where the LGBT headquarters is, you'll find a Wiccan office somewhere really close nearby. I've seen it never fail. But guys, we have our job ahead of us, don't we? Now, before God can take us on, we have got to rediscover the old waste places. We've got to rediscover the paths to walk in. Repentance is essential. It's not a one-time shot. When you understand how God works, when you understand even the feasts, the feasts of the Lord are cycles of repentance. They're cycles of examination. When you go through them every year, there are, there are times that... that Jesus, when, when he appeared on the scene, he said, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. And what we miss is every single, the only way to get into the kingdom is repentance, and the only way to get a promotion in the kingdom is repentance. I have had times that God wanted to take me on and either give me a revelation or help me move in something new. And I said, okay, God, what's, what's, what's holding me back? And I have had the Holy Spirit Show me something that I did when I was 10 years old. I made a bitter root judgment against somebody or somebody, you know, or something. And take me back as something I forgot. It's like, yeah, I do kind of remember that. It kind of sounds familiar. And he said, repent of that because it's holding you back. And I would repent and he would take me on. Repentance is a weapon of mass destruction as far as the enemy is concerned. He's incapable of repenting. Have you ever talked to somebody, let's say uh, you talk to a vet that has PTSD. You've never been a vet. You've never been in, in combat. It's hard to empathize with that, isn't it? Because you have nothing that we relate to it, so you can't connect. Well, the devil can't repent. He never sees it coming. He's blindsided every time it happens. About the time he thinks he's got you where he really wants you, you repent, and now he just lost five years' worth of work. Come on now. He was positioning you. He had, he had been dealing with sister so-and-so in church and brother so-and-so in church to tick you off and to tick you off and to tick you off every service. Sat in your most holy seat that you have reserved there at church, whatever, you know. Said something about your wife's cookies that weren't, you know, wasn't good. How, how dare you? You see, real church splits don't start over anything important. It's over stupid stuff. Like we need to replace the altars. Why? Because last week it fell apart and almost hurt Jimmy. Well, my great great grandpa <laughs> made that in Boy Scouts. <laughs> you know. Come on now. Anybody pastor knows exactly what I'm talking about. And they push it, and they push it, and we won't repent, and we won't repent, and it builds up and builds up. And the devil says, I think I got you. I'm going to split this church seven ways from Sunday, and I'm going to make you a mess where you're never going to be in the Word of God again and in church again. And an evangelist comes, and the whole church starts repenting, and there's the whole thing. I'm sorry, Susan, I shouldn't have said that about your cookies. <laughs> Come on. Part of the revival, make it right. Be quick to repent. Don't let him get that inroad. Repent daily. I like part of Jewish prayer and the concept that they have when they pray in the morning and they pray at night. And at night they do inventory of their life to make sure that there's something they need to make right with God or make right with someone else. Boy, if you do personal inventory every once in a while, what, what a difference that would make in your life. The second is fasting. We have lost the concept of fasting. You know, I remember one time I was preaching to a group of ministers, and I said, no, it doesn't have to be a whole meal. Maybe God will call you to fast coffee for a week. And I had this one pastor say, oh, dear Lord, it's the apocalypse. <laughs> but 
all of us need to tell our flesh to shut up. There's something about fasting that's important. You see, in Jesus' day, the average Jew fasted one to two days a week. Every week. Even the ones that weren't really stringent would fast. And I've always wondered with the Apostle Paul, when you remember the woman that, that had the, uh, the serpentine prophetic spirit in her? Why did it take him two or three days to cast that thing out? You know, I've always been taught. Well, it took him two or three days for discernment to kick in because she's going, Hear these men, they're of God. Hear these men, they're of God. <laughs> you know. <laughs> and I'm thinking, the Apostle Paul had a better head on his shoulders than that. But when you understand the mindset of the early church, they fasted and prayed to decide if they needed to fast and pray. You read the book of Acts? And so he says, okay, I see that there, and it's following me, but I'm not fasted enough yet. So then we miss that in deliverance ministry. We just want to cast out and deal with. If you don't get the house clean, they bring back a whole gang. You got to do pre-counseling. You got to make sure you're fasted up and ready. And I think he fasted those three days until he sensed in his spirit, Holy Spirit said, go get it. It didn't take him four hours. It didn't take him four minutes. He said, get. And that was it. That's what happens when you put fasting in proper perspective. We need to reintroduce that into our lives. Now, those of you that are diabetic, you can't do that like I would. What you do is you pick your most favorite food that you think you would die and fall out on the floor every day if you didn't get to eat. With my wife, it's bread. It's like if she don't have bread, she'd just rather not eat. And when that girl gives up bread, I'm thinking, dear God, this is serious. <laughs> okay? Because you can set aside your favorite food. There, there are many times there are partial fasts like a Daniel fast that you give up. You're just seeking God. And what it does is it pushes down the, the flesh and it begins, you begin to fine-tune your spirit more to the voice of God, to the Word of God. You begin to charge up spiritually. So that's something important that we need to do. Guys, we need to get back in the Word of God. Now, I don't know if I need to tell you guys this, but I've had to tell preachers this. Get your blessed assurance back in the Word. Study to show yourself approved a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. I've went into offices of bishops. Okay, they're pastoring three, 4,000 people, have 100 ministers underneath them, and their library takes this much space on a shelf. And I said, is this, you know, is this, this is what you keep up here you use and how much you got at home? I don't have nothing. What's your, what's your library like, Dr. Lake, 35,000 volumes? <laughs> I'm serious. I got, them, I got them packed up like cordwood in my basement in what used to be an office in the basement. I can't wait to get my new building where I can actually get them back all up on shelves. And thank God for Logos. Mary just loves Logos. I got 7,000 volumes on my computer, and you can't tell it doesn't look like it's gained a bit of weight. <laughs> but to get back in the Word, and all the Word, how many know the Word of God doesn't start with Matthew? <laughs> Genesis. When the Apostle Paul said all Scripture is given by God, the New Testament didn't even exist. He thought the Old Testament plus the Holy Spirit and who Jesus was was enough to get you to turn the world upside down. But we take the New Testament without the Old, we can't even turn our chair upside down. You know what that does when you divorce the Old Testament from the New Testament? You have no definitions. What's well, holiness? You've got to go back and read the Old Testament. Principle of first mention. The first time it's mentioned in the Word of God is its basic definition. It can only expand and grow from there. But when you cut it off, you can make the New Testament say anything you want. Welcome to the modern church. Go back to the Word of God. Go back to prayer. Pray. Mike, how do you pray? How do you talk to your best friend? One that you respect? That's how you pray. Well, how come God isn't talking? He's waiting. You've got a lot of stuff you've got to share first. Because there's a lot of stuff you need to confess and deal with that's sticking, that's like sticking your fingers in your ears. When you talk to him and treat him like a well-respected friend, somebody that you, that you really respect, and you share your heart, what I have found out, if I'm honest, I, I tell God when I'm mad. 
David did knock their teeth out, God. He was a warrior. I've had about enough of that. If you don't knock them out, I will, you know. <laughs> because until you own it, he can't deal with it. you got to own your baggage and say, this is what I'm thinking, this is what I'm feeling, and now I'm asking you to help me do something with it. It's the only way you can grow. you got to talk. Every relationship is built upon communication. And the second way to learn how to hear God's voice is you got to get back in his word. Because if you don't, you open yourself up to other spirits that will say they're God but they never line up with the word. And if you don't get in the word, you're never going to know the difference. We also need to learn to move in spiritual warfare. Do you know what the greatest spiritual warfare is that any of you guys are ever going to face? Now listen to me. It's not the demon on the outside. It's the devil on the inside. Oh, but Mike, I'm saved. Well, your spirit's not the problem. It's all the stuff stuck in your head, man. Haven't you read the Apostle Paul that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds that are between your ears? What's a stronghold? It's a fortified area in which the enemy lives. Uh-oh. Lives? You've got territory in your soul that demonic presences can be plugged into and they know how to push your button. Some people, their stronghold is a spirit of offense. And they're always offended because somebody always does something to offend them, but they don't realize the very spirit in them is causing the person to cause them to be offended. And they have constantly had the spirit of rejection. All these different things going on. When you win the spiritual warfare on the inside, spiritual warfare on the outside is really easy. Because if you're trying to cast out a demon here and you've got a demon in here shooting you from the inside and your faith goes down, the demon on the outside is going to rip off your clothes and you're going to be a, one of the new seven, seven sons of Sceva. Come on now. Because it's all about heart, understanding faith, understanding our authority and who we are in Christ. If you doubt, the enemy can sense it. Paul, I know, the, the, the seven sons of Sceva used the name of Jesus, but they didn't know who Jesus was. Well, he's the one that Paul preaches. Works really good for Paul. We need to dig deeper. The biggest room on this planet is the room for improvement, and all of us need to work on it, don't we? God, give me the courage to deal with the, with the, with the giants in my promised land that I've got to drive out. I've got to drive out the ites. When I drive out the ites, I tear down the fortresses, and I erect a throne for Almighty God there. You rule, you reign, nobody else Nobody has a right to push Mike Lake's buttons but Almighty God. No one has a right to try to control the way that I think except for Almighty God. Nobody has a right to control the way I feel for, except for Almighty God. And I have learned to drive out the ites of the past that so easily controlled me before. Man, when you get that way, you get some armor on. You get, you're tough to, to... Have you ever seen... And, Anybody here been in the military? You, you got that master sergeant, sorry, command sergeant major who's been through some stuff, and here's all his expressions, happy, <laughs> mad, <laughs> perturbed. You can't read him. You just know he means business, and if you don't, if you, when he gives an order, you don't do it, there's going to be hell to pay. That's the way the enemy has to be able to read us. They look at us, they can't read us because they can't push our buttons anymore. All I know, I can't move in the authority of Jesus because I'll hit him with a little inferiority complex. I done crucified that. I know I'm worthless. I know I can't do a thing. You all think I'm really educated and smart? No, I just learned to be a good listener. I listen to him. I realize Mike Lake knows nothing. God knows everything. If I'll sit down, shut up, and listen to him, I can sound really smart. <laughs> Come on now. 
but you begin pulling these things down on the inside. When you get that done, fighting on the outside is so much easier. Because when the enemy looks at you, he sees all the ites that are there. He says, I don't have to worry about her. Half my kinfolk are in there. I'll get them to rioting, no problem. But Jesus told Satan, you have nothing in me. That's going to hit you in a minute. You have nothing in me. When you look at me, you see God in me, Jesus in me, the hope of glory. You see the cross. You see the blood that defeated you. You see he's ruling and reigning on the inside of me. And oh, by the way, since he's established here, I get to wear his armor. And what we talked about the other night, the fire of God. When he sees the fire of God in your eyes, it scares the hell out of him. Because then you're a force to be reckoned with. He doesn't like fire. Our God is a consuming fire. Amen. He's got fire in his eyes and a sword in his hand. Oh, come on now. We need some fire, don't we? I tell you what, my voice is not doing justice. I'm jumping up and down on the inside right now. <laughs> I am jumping up and down on the inside. How many of you here are preachers? We need to move beyond preaching the gospel of salvation. Yeah. It is not the gospel of salvation. Salvation is a side benefit. It's the gospel of the kingdom. You have to call him Lord. You have to bow your knee. You surrender to him. And after that moment, he is Lord. He is God. You are a bondservant in the kingdom and you serve him. It's his kingdom. It's his word. It's his anointing. It's his blood. And you become a citizen and you're judged in that kingdom based upon your faithfulness to the king. When we get to heaven, he's not going to take a vote. Come on now. It is a theocracy. It is not a democracy. He's right. You're not. I learned that the hard way. The school of hard knocks. God says, you want to go down that hard road? It's going to get bumpy, boy. This took one or two times doing that. I thought, you know what? I've decided, Lord, you're right, I'm wrong. You're driving, I'm not. You say go, I go. You say don't, I ain't going no more. Uh-uh. It's the gospel of the kingdom. You see, when we begin walking and become kingdom conscious, you see, I'm not the king. I, I don't... The, 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 the King James Version mistranslates where it talks about that we're kings and priests unto God. No, you're not a king. It's a kingdom of priests. You're a priest. You're a bondservant to the king who owns you, owns everything that, that you have, everything he's blessed you with. He owns the very solar system that you live in. He owns it all. And when you're sold out to him, you find out he also owns all the gold and all the taters underneath. Come on, all the cattle on a thousand hills he owns. We've got to be sold out to him, people. It's the gospel of the kingdom. Hell fears kingdom. Then you find out there's five levels of grace. Didn't know that, did you? Oh, man. There's grace that gets you saved. There's grace that keeps you going. There's grace that gives you breakthroughs. There's grace that helps you finish the, the, finish the walk that you've begun. There's all these different levels of grace. There's also different levels of covenant. We start out, salvation is a blood covenant, which is a bondservant covenant. Then Jesus told his disciples, he says, I no longer call you servants, I call you friends. It's a salt covenant. Boy, in that salt covenant, he's the king. You see, if, if I served a physical king here, Everything I own, if he's my friend and I love him and I serve him, is at his disposal. Knowing that if he sends me to a task, everything at his disposal will be behind me when I go. And he knows I got his back. <clears throat> I was at a conference 
And this one woman was, was you, know, you know, it has to be Yeshua instead of Jesus. And I, have, I, I love the Hebrew names, don't get me wrong. But she started telling me how the name of Jesus was powerless and didn't mean anything. And this about started to spit on the ground and I about come over that table. I was about to show her U.S. Army. <laughs> no, you're, you're talking about my king. Now in Hebrew, it's Yeshua. His name is Yeshua. In English, it's Jesus. In Spanish, it's Jesus, and it, doesn't, it is not connected with Zeus. Many different languages, every tongue, every tribe, will call in their own language upon his name, and heaven will hear. Don't you go talking about my king and my best friend like that. No. In fact, his name is more important than my name. Come on. He's my king. The third level covenant is an inheritance covenant, a shoe covenant. He took off their shoes and washed their feet. It's an inheritance. How many know we have an inheritance in Christ? Most people, because they, they never progress enough to move from bondservant to friend, never get the inheritance released in their life. There's levels of God, guys. There's levels of the kingdom. It's all there. It's all waiting for us. And Jesus is saying, come on, guys. What's the final level? Marriage covenant. I got a wedding coming up one of these days. Oh, you don't, you don't get it yet. You're going to get it here in a minute. And the book of Revelation. I got eight minutes I get to finish with this. The book of Revelation, Jesus is dealing with this selfish, money-hungry, Laodicean, lukewarm church. And he says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. And we've used that for salvation. That's not what it's about. If you understand the Jewish culture, let's say Mary and I are kids in our community. We fall in love. We want to get married. She goes, talk to her dad. I go, talk to mine. On the appointed day, I and my father go to their door and knock. And her dad looks at her and says, you want to let this joker in? Yeah, dad, he's the one I want to marry. We come in and we have supper together. Her dad and her, my dad and me. And then my job is to tell her who I feel like I'm going to become in my life, my task, my duty, and that I am going to prepare a place for her in my father's house. Come on. Can you see Jesus talking to the church? I am almighty God come in the flesh. I am the creator. I will rule on the throne of my father David, and I will rule over planet earth in a Jewish court established in Jerusalem. I'm preparing a place for you in my father's house or many mansions. I'm going, when I get her done, I'm coming back. Okay? We want to stop there, don't we? Woohoo, look what the Lord has done. <laughs> but it doesn't stop there. The family of the woman looks to the bridegroom and his father and says, okay, now what does she have to learn? What does she have to change to become the helpmeet for what you just said you are? That's our task right now. We're preparing to rule and reign with him. We're preparing that no matter where we go, we carry his name. We carry the authority of the bridegroom. We carry, we represent him in all that we do. We're preparing that now. And when we begin getting that attitude and that concept on the inside, demons begin to tremble. I tell you what, when you go to Walmart, you just thought it's like Moses parting the Red Sea. All these demons go, whoa! It should be that way. We should clear a place when we walk in because we represent our bridegroom. It's no longer about the bride. We got it all backwards. And it was, the wedding day is all about the bride, all about the bride. This is my special day. No, I'll tell you what, we're coming to a special day and it's all about him. It's all about him. But I tell you one thing the brides do have right. From the day they say, I will, to I do, it's all about getting ready. Do you think that's by accident? The day that you bow the knee to Jesus, to the day he calls you home, it's all about getting ready. 
It's all about saying, I'll change anything I need to change. I will learn anything I need to learn. I will do anything I need to do. And one of the most glorious scriptures in all the book of Revelation is, come, let us rejoice and be glad. For the marriage of the Lamb has come because his wife has made herself ready. I feel heaven's desire that he wants his wife ready. He wants her whole. He wants her complete. He wants her dressed in white robes of holiness because there's only two mysteries in all the Word of God. The mystery of iniquity, which will be personified in the Antichrist, and the mystery of godliness, which was personified in Jesus. And he's wanting us to be like him. Oh, can you feel it? Can you feel it? Let's get rid of churchianity. Just throw it out the door. It, it is a placebo. It's about a vibrant, living relationship with Almighty God the creator of heaven and earth that so loved you, that fell so madly in love with you, that he came and put on an earth suit because you couldn't hold the penalty of your sin. And he said, I'll die on a cross to get her back. What, what, what do I have to give Jesus? His sacrifice, the only just thing is to give him everything. I don't care. My ideas don't count. My, my, my desires don't count. I want to think like my king. I want to smell like my king. I want to speak like my king. I want to act so much like my king that they get him and I confused. <laughs> Isn't that what happened in Al Oh, You're just trying to be like little Jesus. Says, well, thank you very much. Go ahead and call me a Christian. <laughs> a little Christ running around. Thank you very much. I spent so much time with him. There's a new level for every one of us here. We need to represent what we see in the book of Acts, that they begin to speak with power, and it frustrated the Pharisees. These are unlearned men, but, but they've been with Jesus. There's a new level waiting. There's a new level waiting. Father, I just pray over one that's here today in the name of Jesus. And Father, I bind up the enemy from preventing us from going to the next level. Father, I ask that you would loose an anointing that would make bondages break. Father, that you would loose an anointing to heal the brokenhearted. Father, I believe right now that you have touched our hearts and you're beginning to set us free. And Father, the resentment or our lives of the past we're letting go right now. And Father, more than anything else, we just want to see Jesus. We want to see him in the word. We want to see him in prayer. We want to see him in worship. Lord, make us that church without spot nor wrinkle. Father, I ask right now that you would touch our hearts, open our eyes, and let us just simply fall madly in love with our Savior. Restore that first love. And Father, just make it consume our lives that this world loses its luster with all its gold and its silver and its fame because it's nothing compared to him knowing our name. And Father, we thank you and we praise you for it in Jesus' name.